My name is Michael Dubois, and uh, I am a product manager um, at uh, Broadcom, longtime CA uh, guy. I started with CA in 1984. Uh, in my current role in the mainframe division at Broadcom, I lead the uh, product management team for our open mainframe value stream. My team is working every day to try to change the way people interact with the mainframe. Um, I also have a DevOps background. I know Jeff mentioned that we'll uh, dive down a little bit uh, into DevOps today, and I'm happy to uh, talk to anybody offline about what we're doing in DevOps as well. But today what I'd really like to talk about uh, with you is skills. Uh, and I'd like to uh, share with you some of the things that uh, we've learned from speaking with some of our uh, other customers. Uh, I'd also like to talk about how technology and other things are influencing uh, and impacting the way we think about the skills shortage and how we deal with the skills shortage. And, uh, and I guess uh, more importantly than anything else, I'd like to talk about how we can all create a culture that would um, you know, enable some of the things that, uh, that we're all you know, looking to accomplish with sustainable skills. Uh, a culture which encourages learning and education and skills development. I don't think I'm going to say anything proprietary today or go into any roadmap, so I'm just going to skip past here. But if I do say anything proprietary, just so you know that uh, it's all with the uh, best intentions of what I know based on today. So we have, a, um, we have a, an advisory council that we use for mainframe, and uh, we meet with them regularly, and we, um, you know, we learn a lot from them. And recently we had a meeting with uh, some of our um, advisory council uh, customers in Prague, and um, we did a little bit of a speedboat exercise with them and uh, tried to learn a little bit about what they were thinking about skills. And I just want to share with you some of the things that we learned from them and, and a couple of surprises that I found uh, very interesting. So I also want to kind of understand if uh, the things that they were thinking are similar to the things that you guys are thinking. So when asked uh, what does paradise look like, uh, obviously our customers are interested in having a sustainable workforce and an agile workforce right? that uh, enables them to have uh, real business agility. They want to be able to use the skills and reuse the skills that they have and transfer them easily so that they can onboard easily. They want to create environments for development that are friendly for everybody so that, so that uh, you know, people can, can you know, easily get ramped up and started and they don't have to go through major adjustments when moving from one, you know, one team to another, one project to another. They want to have time for new skills. They want to be able to learn continuous learning. They don't want to just get to a, uh, to a specific you know, goal and say, OK, now we have sustainable skills and we're done. They want to be able to continuous, uh, you know, continuously learn um, you know, as technology evolves. And they see all of, it, all of this as um, a way for them to be able to deliver faster for their customers. And obviously, that's going to drive revenue. So their needs are. Uh, pretty well, I guess pretty obvious. They need system programmer skills. They need uh, developer skills. They they categorize the skills that they're looking for as both deep and broad. And they outlined a number of risks that uh, exist if they don't uh, get to their goal of paradise. And those risks include not growing, not being able to have uniform technology, um, not being able to onboard people <coughs> easily or even at all. Pressure, a lot of people were afraid of pressure from sea level to get off the mainframe platform if they can't solve this problem. And they also fear that they would end up having to pay higher wages for the mainframe. So what are the things that are in the way uh, of getting to paradise? First of all, nobody teaches Z anymore, right? Well, that's not exactly true, but most universities don't teach Z. The people who are learning about mainframe don't always have a positive perception of it. It's thought of as old. It's thought of with words like legacy. People don't, um, we've had some very, very skilled candidates that, that we wanted to hire who actually turned down offers from us because they said that their parents told them that they would be pigeonholed into the mainframe and they would never be able to use those skills for anything else. Um, the architecture is legacy. The technology is legacy. Um, and also, some of our customers have told us that 
time to value for mainframe training activities, it's too long. They don't really get the return quickly enough uh, when they try to uh, bring skills, mainframe skills, to, uh, to new hires. So this is the box where, I, I mean, I read this probably a dozen times before I finally realized what was wrong with it or what was bothering me about it. And um, what it is is how many of these 11 items that are listed here have anything to do with putting somebody through a boot camp or sitting them next to a smart mainframer so that it rubs off, right? It's not really about how do we take a kid out of school and teach him how to do the things that you know, my 40-year mainframe guy has been doing. It's, it's more about how do we create an environment that enables them to use the skills that they already have? How do we give them more time? How do we change the platform so that we can do things differently so that it's easier for us to have sustainable skills going forward? So they talk about creating uh, an environment where there are common tools. They talk about creating uh, an environment where we're thinking about everything across enterprise, not thinking about the mainframe differently like a silo, but thinking about it like any other platform, right? Uh, how do we open it up with, with APIs so that it's easier to access uh, things on the mainframe, right? How do we make it simpler so that it's not harder, so that it's not more complex, so that it doesn't scare people? And how do we automate so that the machine can do the things that the machine is good at and can do really quickly and the humans can do what we need the humans to be doing? And then, of course, there's training and mentoring, and that's a very, very big part about it. And I don't want to just skip over that like it's nothing, but, but um, it's, it's the smallest piece of this, right? How do, we, how do we teach people about mainframe? Well, that's the easy part, right? How do we create an environment where it sticks? And how do we attract people to the platform? That's the hard part. And t towards the bottom, they talk about how to make sure that the people who are being attracted to the platform see it as a long-term gig. How they, they know that they're going somewhere. They're not going to be pigeonholed. There's a roadmap. But this is what my role is going to be now. This is what my role is going to be later. This is what my career path looks like. Right? Show me that this is something that I can evolve in. They look at me and they say, you've been with, uh, with CA and now Broadcom your entire career. Show me how I'm going to be able to do that. Right? Um, of course, you can also attract people to the platform with higher pay. That always works, right? So that's one thing that a lot of uh, customers have been trying. And in fact, in other countries, there have been um, programs where, uh, you know, where you, they, would, they would go right in. I think Australia is one of them, right? Where they're actually approaching uh, students in high school, not even college. And they're offering, um, you know, for, in exchange for learning mainframe skills in college, come to work for us later and they're guaranteeing uh, education without any debt, you know, debt-free college education, right? So it comes to financial benefits as well. And finally, a community. It's, it's, it's really a community and a culture of learning where they're supported, they have mentors, they have opportunities for learning, they can take advantage of learning, they can learn not only by sitting next to a really smart person, but also by having experiences of their own. And if we can create that environment, I think we can get to paradise a lot, a lot more quickly. So there are some things that change the way we think about uh, the skills problem. Obviously, technology is the big one, right? Technology is changing ridiculously quickly, right? Every time you turn around, there's, there's, there's new technology. There are new tools. There are, you know, there are new frameworks, right? I mean, we just saw Zoe. It's another one, right? So. Um, the, the fact that technology is changing is wonderful. The fact that we have all this technology is wonderful. The problem that we have with it is not all of that technology crosses the chasm over to the mainframe, right? So a lot of our customers will tell us, we're doing really great over here on the distributed side, and we've got all of these great tools, and look at how well we can, you know, we can deliver quickly to our customers, and we can onboard people, and everything's great. When it comes to the mainframe, it just gets harder. So how do we break down that? that barrier? How do, we, how do we get those tools and technologies to work across that chasm so that we are uh, thinking about the mainframe as part of the ecosystem? Also, the things that we're thinking about in business are, are different now, right? Today, the focus more than ever before is about user experience, customer experience, and personalization. Um, businesses can be maniacal about this. So let's make sure that we're actually thinking about building the right skills. They're, they're not the, necessarily the traditional mainframe skills that we need to have more of. 
Uh, we definitely need to have some more mainframe skills, but there are other things that we have to be thinking about. So how do we make sure that we're building the right skills? What kind of education is available? And what are we doing to enable our team members to have time and opportunity to, 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 to continue to learn? And how are we doing as far as creating an environment where collaboration is a big part, where we enable knowledge transfer so that we can actually share the skills that we already have and apply them in different ways? The business is challenged. I think we've seen a few interesting numbers in terms of how much the mainframe does, but still we know, and this is actually a little bit lower uh, than maybe a few years ago, but it's not dropping very much. About 70% of the machine readable data still lives on the mainframe platform. And we need that data, and we need to make that data accessible to our, uh, you know, to our developers and to our customers all the time in order to create that, that customer experience that I was just talking about. If you talk to you know, C-level people, and we do very often, what we learn is that they are more and more concerned about customer experience than ever before, and that's going to continue to increase. They're, I think I used the word maniacal. I could use it again. Very, very concerned about every customer interaction and, and creating the right winning experience for their customers. Customers will tell you that they're really only interested in doing business with, with companies that think that way. Right? So having that data available, being able to get at that data is just critical for that. And, and it's going to become more critical as we go forward. And technology, as I mentioned earlier, doesn't always get you all the way to the mainframe. All right? We have great technology that helps us deliver to customers faster. The things that we're doing in DevOps are, are, are outstanding. But, but when you hit the mainframe and it becomes an obstacle, that's, you know, that's a big problem. So how do we get across that chasm? How do we make the mainframe just like any other platform? One of the things we learned with our own associate software engineering program is it doesn't make sense to hire really smart people who have really good skills. They don't happen to be the skills that we need them to have, or at least that we think we need them to have. So we bring them into house and we say, all right, here's the job. This is what you have to do. Now go learn Rex and JCL and TSO command so that you can figure out how to do that. And if you have any trouble with it, go sit next to Chip because he's really good at that. Right? So what we did instead was we trusted our teams to you know, figure out how to, how to get the job done. And believe it or not, they figured out how to do it with modern technologies as well. I think Jeff gave. Uh, a, a little preview of the story, but we, I mean, we had a, a team in Pittsburgh that was trained on mainframe technology and, um, and they were working on mainframe products and they were working with source code, which all of our source code is in Endeavor, of course, on the mainframe. And you know, basically, as the story goes, they like Endeavor, it's, you know, it's fine, it's good enough for me, but we're really good at Git and we've been using it for a long time. And we really think we could do our job better if we could just work in Visual Studio Code and use Git. And, and so they figured out how to do that, right? And we, we trusted them to do that. And they went off and they built a command line interface to talk to the mainframe, to talk to Endeavor, to access their source code. And so we were rewarded as a company because we got this new award-winning product out of it, CA Brightside, which we delivered a year ago, which started out just as some team trying to figure out how to do their job using tools that they were already familiar with so that they can do their job better. And that was great. And actually, as Jeff was telling you earlier, that uh, same technology that we released as CA Brightside became the foundation for, uh, or one of the foundations for that uh, open source platform that we just talked about, and that, that being Zoe. And so now, um, you know, that, that team that you know, just wanted to figure out a better way to do their job and use the skills that they already had has actually helped us to launch Zoe for everybody. So that's, that's how we got rewarded for that. Well, we've heard a lot about, and it was a very good conversation downstairs as well, but we've heard a lot about uh, taking advantage of analytics, machine learning, uh, automation, of course. All right, you know, really, in, in, you know, when it comes to uh, addressing skills. It's really about making more time, making things easier, and taking a lot of that burden off of our experts, right? It really is 
um, you know, silly to have uh, you know the the ability for the machine to do a lot of that work for us. The machine can, can can consume massive quantities of data and figure out things so much quicker than humans can. So, so this just gives us more time for humans to be doing the things that you know that we know that humans do very well and that we hired them for. You can't just get there and say, okay, now we're there, right? The thing about skills is they're going to constantly need to evolve. Um, Technology is going to change. Data is going to continuously teach us new things, right? And so, again, we need to just continue to uh, create an environment where our team members have time for learning, where it's important. Uh, we need to, you know, leverage uh, AI and leverage machine learning to give them ample opportunity. And we just need to change the standard. Yesterday's standard, we were doing really well if we found out about a problem and we jumped on it right away. Our customers were happy. Something happened this morning and they got a call back by 3 o'clock and everything was good, right? So we're reactive and, and you know, we've got some good insights and, and, and things are good, right? Well, tomorrow's standard's a lot, you know, the bar's a lot higher, right? We want to be, we want to use foresight. We want to be more proactive and predictive. And, um, and also, so going back to the example that we heard earlier, right? Three weeks ago, there was an outage. Um, you know, um, the machine is smart enough to consume all that data and look back and say, hey, you know what? We knew that you were going to have that outage hours before anybody knew that there was even a problem. And guess what? The conditions are almost the same again right now. We may be heading for another outage, right? And you know, maybe we should be doing something before we even knew there was a problem. But better than that, we know that the last time we had this problem, we were able to resolve that problem by doing A, B, and C, right? Maybe we don't, you know, maybe we learn from that too. Maybe we don't need you to do A, B, C, B and C. Maybe we can do that in an automated manner as well. And we could just stay ahead of that outage. So we need to raise the bar and continually uh, evolve. So. I mean, really what we, what we want to try to do, going back to that first slide that I had uh, from what our MSAC customers taught us, it's really not just about taking smart kids and teaching them something new. It's really about you know, figuring out ways that we can eliminate those barriers without that requirement for all of those really deep expert skills that we think we need, that we have today, right? I mean, we can definitely do things that would would take some of that burden off of our experts and make it easier for us to sustain uh, the set of skills that we need to run our business without all that expert knowledge, right? Put less of the burden on our experts and also, you know, taking advantage of, of machine learning and AI. Now, if we do this, we're going to have more time. We're going to have more time for innovation. You're going to have more time to pursue opportunities that you need to pursue. You're going to be more efficient. You're going to have the time for, for more learning, which was important to all of our customers. Are those seconds or minutes? Thank you. Uh, you're going to have more time for, our, uh, for learning, right? And, and, and so, um, you know, the customers told us, you know, you know it was very clear that they, they don't want to just get there. They want to be able to create an, uh, an environment and a culture where learning is a part. And they never have to worry about having the time to create, uh, you know, time for learning. They always have that as part of their plan. So I want to share a few things. I've used the word enablers probably more than I should have. I use that word a lot, but um, several times say, how do we enable our teams to, um, you know, to, to leverage education? How do we enable them to, uh, to get their job done? Uh, things, that, things that we can do to enable our team members. Uh, here are some things that worked for us and when we speak with our customers. Uh, some things that work for them as well. The first one is open technologies. And I know we've touched on it a little bit already today, but I mean open technologies and the mainframe, it, they, they don't really belong in the same sentence, right? But no, that's not true. Um, it's, it's the way we, you know, we break down that barrier. It's the way we make the mainframe just like any other platform. We open the platform up. We open the technology up. We allow people to bring the tools that they, that they know, that they're, you know, the skills that they're good at, bring them to the platform. And there's no reason why any of those tools shouldn't work with the mainframe just the way they work with any other you know, cloud platform or any other platform. So by you know, enabling our team members to take advantage of 
you know, open technologies, you'll be really surprised, and I promise you pleased, when you see how they use it, right? You, know, you saw the example of what they did for us. Um, you know, they're, they're really smart people. They're going to use these tools and they're going to figure out, you know, how to do the job that you need them to do. And you need to trust them to do that. And that's something that, you know, by empowering your teams, that's something that's going to help, help your teams and your organization to grow. The other thing that's really worked very well for us, my team hates this because I say it probably every day and I'm so annoying when I say it, but who are we doing this for? What are they trying to do? What are they struggling with? And how can we help them? So for my team, it's important that every person working on every project understands not just what we're doing, but why we're doing it and who we're doing it for. When you empower your team that way, and they really understand that the thing that they're building is going to help somebody else outside of Broadcom to do their job, and that they're going to make somebody else's life easier, that motivates them. Right? That's what makes our team want to be here and want to do the things that, that they're doing and then want to learn more and want to put in the extra effort. Right? That's the motivation that really works and you can see it on their faces. So we expose them to as many customers as we can through our validation programs, through our sprint reviews. Right? We, we get them involved in customer calls. They like talking to our customers and learning about the things that our customers are trying to do. They love hearing about what customers struggle with. So I recommend that, that, you know, making sure that your team members know when you bring new people in, make sure they understand what you're doing and who you're doing it for. And we get to Zoe. So, so we talked a little bit about, um, you know, how Brightside command line interface got started. Everything that we did with CA Brightside has been <coughs> contributed to the open source community for Zoe. Uh, Zoe is, um, is, is the most, probably the most exciting thing in my, in my 34 years. I mean, I, I was saying last night in a bar, I, I, you know, I, I love my mainframe career. I started out as an old assembler guy, right? Well, I actually started out as a young assembler guy. I became an old assembler guy. Um, so it got me out of bed from day one. I love coming to work and I loved what I did, right? But I've never been as excited about the future of the mainframe as I am today. And I know that's a statement that, you know, you wouldn't think you'd be hearing in 2019, especially since 20 years ago the mainframe was supposed to be gone already, right? But something like this is just so different, so exciting, and has opened up so many opportunities. Now, how did it happen? So we had, um, you know, conversations with our customers around command line interface originally, around Brightside, around our API mediation layer started to get some feedback from customers like, hey, you know what IBM is working on? They're working on you know, this thing with the REST APIs and you know it would be really good. You could probably work with them and you can leverage some of that with your command line interface. Hey, that would be great. So we talked to IBM. They're hearing some of the same stuff. Hey, did you hear what CA was working on? Right. And also Rocket is working on this thing where you know, it's, a, it's a web UI and it gives you, uh, you know, application containers that get, let you create you know, custom dashboards that <coughs> leverages REST APIs on the back end. All of these pieces get together and you've created a, a, an ecosystem, you know, a framework that people can use and to modernize the mainframe. And it's open, which means you can extend it. You can plug into, in fact, this is what you're going to see on our roadmaps, right? And here's where I start talking about roadmap. Across our portfolio without specifics, you're going to see our products finding, our product teams finding ways to help their customers by taking the capabilities that already exist in the products that they sell and making them, you know, exposing them to make them available through REST APIs, to make them available through command line interfaces so that we can solve problems differently going forward. We're doing it with some of our ops products. We've been doing it with some of our DevOps products. We're going to continue to do it. I'm sure we'll do it with security products. And when we do that, and we'll see other vendors do that, and, and then we'll see customers. In fact, we already see customers releasing YouTube videos showing the world how they're leveraging Zoe and what you can do with it and how exciting this is. I mean, we see one like every week. There's another customer doing another, you know, another YouTube video for Zoe. So it's just really, really exciting. And it's so extensible. And, and it's going to continue to grow. And 
It's going to as the community grows. I think we just established there's always been already been thousands of of uh, downloads of Zoe. The community is just exploding. There's just so many people who are you can't go to LinkedIn, you can't go to Twitter without you know reading something about about Zoe. It's just that exciting to everybody. So yeah, I'd love to talk more about Brightside and Zoe. Uh, what we did at Share just a couple of months ago, we uh, or even a month ago, God time. Um, is uh, we announced that Brightside is, uh, well, we announced that we're going, Broadcom is going to provide uh, enterprise level support for Zoe. We're going we're to have a support offering for Zoe. And what we're doing now is we are, um, you know, e we're evolving Brightside into a commercially available support offering from Broadcom for Zoe, which is going to help with the adoption of Zoe. Um, we'll help our customers to, um, you know, to leverage Zoe. And as vendors start to build solutions on top of Zoe, uh, it'll give somebody. Uh, it'll give you somebody who can um, provide that support. You know, a trusted partner who can provide support for you. And we're going to do that uh, for our Brightside Enterprise customers. I probably shouldn't have said enterprise, right? Because it's just going to be Brightside now. Um, so, a couple of people have already talked about this. Um, I just wanted to finish up with um, something that Broadcom is doing that can help our customers with the, uh, with the skills problem, and that is uh, our vitality program. Basically, you know the challenge, right? I mean, we, you know, we've got skills problems. Uh, we're losing skilled people, and um, it's really hard to find uh, the people with the right skills. Five seconds left. Um, solution is uh, we, can, we can help with the training. We're pretty good at that. We've been doing it for a long time with a couple of programs. We've been doing it with our own associate engineers. We've got a lot of expertise in solutions that we've been providing to our customers for a long time, and a lot of subject matter experts, and, uh, and so we can help. And the way we're going to do it, uh, we're starting in 2019 with a, a pilot for our database products that is uh, a data common IDMS. And uh, there's already future plan to extend that to other products. I think Jeff mentioned Endeavor, and uh, there are others that are still queued up for, uh, for future um, vitality programs. And it actually works a couple of different ways, but it involves uh, you know, Broadcom doing training. Uh, you know, there's a couple of different ways that the person could be hired. Uh, I don't think on the next slide I, I'll walk through those ways. But, um, you know, basically, you've got a person who gets trained on, you know, basic Z skills. Then they, they spend time with subject matter experts uh, to learn our database products as part of this pilot, and then they do a residency with uh, with a customer, and they, they you know they learn um, you know during the residency, and then when they're done, they're available for hire, and if you want to hire them, then that's great. Um, and that's, and that's you know, really a simplification, but, um, but there's other ways that it works, right? I mean, also, you know, customers can hire somebody and send them to Broadcom to do the training, right? And we can do that too. We can also just do site engagements and leverage the field team. So there are a lot of different ways that, um, you know, that we can help with the skills problem. And if anybody wants to talk about the Vitality program, and I think everybody's already said this, right? But I had the... the the woman who runs the program for us, Deb Carbo, she made me swear that I would say that if anybody's interested in the Vitality program, um, that I should hook, hook you up with Deb. So just come and see me, um, and uh, if you're interested, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you her uh, name, and I'll, I'll give her your name and hook you guys up. Um, and just a, you know, a list of some of the things that we've been doing that we've got experience with that we've gotten pretty good at, our mainframe academy for basic ZOS skills, our associate software engineering program that we've been using for over a decade to um, bring our own uh, engineers up to speed, and now our vitality program. There's also plenty of um, you know, online um, you know, web-based web and instructor-led training. There's the e-learning library, videos and books. There are a lot of different ways that we can um, you know, provide help with uh, education for mainframe. So bottom line, let's not just focus on the training part, right? Let's focus on making uh, it easier to work with the mainframe. And if we make it easier to interact with the technology, and if we are uh, you know, smart about taking advantage of skills we already have and, and, and being open to applying those skills to new areas, then yeah, the education is really important and the mentoring is extremely important to create the right uh, culture, right? 
Um, I had the best mentor when I started out 34 years ago. He was like a big brother. And I'm telling you, you cannot, I can't overstate how important it is to make sure that every new person who's learning something new, who's coming out of school especially, has a mentor that they can lean on when they need, when they need help. But, I mean, you can, you can crush the skills problem if you just, you know, if you just do these little things, right? And we can help. So if, uh, if you have any questions, if you'd like to talk more, uh, you know, find me. Uh, I'll be here until probably about 4 o'clock today, and thank you. <laughs>